Hey everyone, good morning. It's good to be with you today. We're actually gonna talk about, um, anyways, I'm just gonna share with you some ponderings actually from Isaiah. I'm sitting here right now doing my Bible study, diving into the word of God. I happen to be in the book of Isaiah and it was just an aha moment. So I wanna share that with you. So, um, you know, I was in um, Isaiah seven, okay, and, and basically, in this portion of Isaiah, the future for the people of God is looking rather gloomy. Can anyone relate to that? Do we have seasons where life looks gloomy, where things are unsure, where we're not sure what our future looks like? And that's where they're at right now. And actually, in this moment, the, the nation had divided into two. And so you, know, you also have division within the nation. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Do you find division within your nation, you know, within your country? And so with this, of course, there's various alliances being formed. And you know, there, there's, there is pressure, there is strife, there is insecurity, there's a lot of things that are unknown. And basically Isaiah says to King Ahaz, he, he goes and he's the king of Judah, Okay, he um, he basically says to him, you know what, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. And I think that's one thing that the Lord is saying to us also right now, is to be careful, okay, use wisdom, look for the wisdom from the Holy Spirit, walk with the Lord, and through that, keep calm, okay, and don't be afraid, because we know that anything but fear of the Lord is a problem, right? So, I think that's a word for us to today. Be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid, which again, that's the Cliff Notes version of what Isaiah is saying to King Ahaz. You know, in other words, trust in the Lord, even in the season, even when things feel a little shaky, um, you know, just keep your trust, keep your focus in the right spot, and everything will be okay. And in the midst of this, Isaiah even says to King Ahaz, you know, why don't you ask the Lord? for a sign okay and so he's basically saying okay let the lord bring the reassurance let him be the one who comes and this is where it got so interesting because um what happens is ahaz says i will not ask nor will i tempt the lord sounds really good right it's like that's a really holy you know okay i don't need a sign from the lord i'm not going to ask for a sign but as i'm diving into the study what he's basically saying that's not a really holy wonderful statement he's actually saying i'm not going to ask because i'm going to look elsewhere for help that's basically what he's saying in other words i'm not going to turn my focus to the lord so i'm not going to ask for a sign he's not being holy and saying i don't need a sign He's basically saying, I don't want to sign. And I found that really, really interesting because it puts the next section into perspective. And maybe I'll teach on this more around Christmas. But right now I'm just unpacking it. I was sitting here going, oh my gosh, I never realized that. So I wanted to share this with you. So Isaiah 7, 13. Um, okay, so 12 says, and Ahaz says, I will not ask, nor will I tempt the Lord. Okay, in and of itself, if we just pull that out, it sounds really good, but he's actually, it's actually a slam against God. Um, and then, and then he goes, you know, Isaiah's like, wait, are you going to weary God? You know, forget it. And he goes on at verse 14. This is, this would be Isaiah speaking. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat at the time that he knows enough to refuse evil and choose the good. But before the child shall know to re refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken of both her kings. The Lord shall bring upon you and your people and upon the father's house days that have not come from the day of Ephraim departed Judah, even the king of Assyria. So when we look at that, what's happening is, you know, we, we so often quote that, you know, the Lord will give you you assign the virgin shall conceive a bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Okay, so here we are. Remember, Ahaz is a descendant of David, okay? And God made a promise to David that one of his descendants would always sit on the throne. I have a helper here, by the way, this is Harley. Um, anyways, he made, he made a promise to David that one of his descendants would always sit on the throne. Okay, so here is Ahaz kind of high and mighty thinking, well, God needs me. 
The truth is God was going to keep his promise to David a totally different way. In other words, the sons of David were increasingly not walking with the Lord. So the Lord was going to keep his covenant, his promise to David, but he was not going to have it come through the sons. This is where a virgin, Mary, a descendant of David, would bear a son. So what is actually said here in this, in this section of Isaiah that we quote so often at Christmas time? Um, you know, the virgins, the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Well, that's actually a word of um, judgment. It's not a while this is coming in that moment. It's actually a word of judgment against Ahaz. And against the, it, at that point, and I, you know, the, the males in the line of David, because they had not been following the Lord. And so this is what, um, this is what Tim Chester says. He says, um, Ahaz is a descendant of King David and God had promised David that his line would always rule over God's people. So it looks like God needs Ahaz so God could keep his promise to David. But here God is saying, I can bring the reign of David's godless sons to an end and start it again with a virgin. King Ahaz thinks he could do without God, but it's God who can do without Ahaz. God can judge the house of David and still fulfill his promise to, to David by raising up a king from a virgin. Yes, God will defeat Israel and Aram, but God will also judge Judah. And so it goes on and, and he just points out that the promised boy will grow up eating honey and curds, which is a, um, a food of poverty, which actually points to the fact that Judah's economy will collapse. And it did. And so um, he goes on, he says, so Jesus will come and be called Emmanuel, God with us. But before this happens, both Israel and Judah will have experienced defeat and exile. And what really got me, number one, is I didn't realize when I read that, just without really diving in, when you read it on the surface, it doesn't appear to be a judgment. But when you put it into context and put everything around it, then you see that in the midst of a, a judgment, you see the promise of God at a whole different level. And that just really, really caught my attention. The other thing that caught my attention is the understanding as far as the Messiah coming down through David's line the thought would be that it would always be through the men. And, and it was, you know, for, for a period of time, but as the men wandered, God, it, like that didn't stop God. And, and so I love what Tim Chester says is that God could fulfill his promise, but still bring judgment. And so that really caught me so often when things are not going the way we think they should go. We think that God may be is not fulfilling his promises, but he is actually, God will always fulfill his promise, but the route or the path may look different. So when I looked at this, besides going, oh my gosh, I never realized that. I also saw the power of God, even in the midst of difficult situations, that he will fulfill his promises, that he is just good. He is faithful. He is there. He is true. But again, it can look different than what we than what we think it should. So if you're if you have this promise that you're hanging on to, and you might even find yourself in the middle of judgment. I mean, one of the things that we're that we're trying to figure out right now is is um, with everything going on around us. You know, um, the judgment of God versus the mercy of God versus the promises of God. Okay, all these things are kind of um, colliding right now, and there's not a lot of clarity on it. But what there is clarity on and or what we need to remember doesn't change is the promises of God are yes and amen. God's always for his people. Okay, but sometimes the route doesn't look the way that we think it should look, but ultimately he will be glorified. So this word of judgment here in the moment brings us great freedom later on. When you think about it, you know, the, the coming of Jesus Christ, the coming of the Messiah, the cross of Jesus Christ, the curse being broken, death being defeated. So it, it, you know, that, that which is in this, in this moment, when we're looking at Isaiah is actually spoken as a word of judgment. It's also a promise. It's a remembrance of the covenant of, of God and a promise of what's coming in the future. So we take all that and it goes, you know, it goes hand in hand together. So again, it was just, um, I'm still digesting it. I'm still, um, it's something I'm going to sit with for a while. I really want to come to understand it better. And then I'll, I'll come back and I'll do a deeper dive into it. 
but I just found it was so interesting this morning that I wanted to just stop, share it with you guys, let you ponder about it a little bit. Again, that, that section is found in Isaiah 7 is where I was reading. And it's just, you know, the, the part, you know, where he says, I will not ask, that's verse 12. The prophetic word about the virgin comes in in verse 14. And so it's that section right there. So again, I just want to encourage you because even when it, when it, when things are not looking the way that we want them to look, God is a covenant God. God is a covenant God. He will not break that covenant. He will not break the covenant he has with you. He will not break the covenant he has with me. He will always redeem and restore. In the midst of that, yes, judgment can come in. Our job is to keep calm, keep focused on him, keep trusting him, reminding ourselves of his promises and his goodness. That's our job in the middle of all this, even in the things that we don't understand, because he is a covenant God and he will always keep his promise. And that's something you can say right now. My God will always keep his promise. So yes and amen. So again, um, thank you for joining me today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ruth Hendrickson. Ministry is RHM International. You can find out more about us at ruthhendrickson.org. Would love to have you just uh, dive in, sign up for the email list. As far as these Facebook Lives, we do them five days a week, Monday through Friday. There'll always be something up. We put it up at 8.15 in the morning, Eastern time. You can always join us and comment on that. There's also a podcast that I have called Real Truth with Ruth. You can find it on um, CPN shows or wherever you get your podcast from, you should be able to find it. So um, so would love to have you subscribe to that and rate and review. And so anyways, um, just know that God's faithful. That's the word for today. God is faithful. Amen. God is faithful. So whatever you have on your agenda, whatever you're doing today, may you know that the faithfulness of God abounds in your life, whether it looks like it or not. He's a God of the covenant. He is for you or not against you. He has great plans and purposes for you. He wants to bring healing into your life. He wants to restore joy. He wants to set you free. He wants to release you to dream again because that's who he is. And he is a good God and his word, his plans, his purposes will come to pass. Have a great day and be so blessed.